Hello and welcome to our online lecture for the course Anatomy and Physiology 2. In today's lecture we're discussing gas exchange and transport. During our last lecture on ventilation we spoke about the mechanism by which air moves in and out of the lungs with the basis being because of a pressure gradient and the purpose being bringing, being able to bring oxygen into the body and expel carbon dioxide out. In this online lecture, we're going to be discussing how the individual gases within the air that we breathe in diffuse across the alveolar membrane, and we'll also talk about what regulates this function. This here is Dalton's Law, not to be confused with Boyle's Law discussed in the ventilation lecture. Remember that air moves from areas of high pressure to areas of lower pressure. The pressure of that air, however, is the sum total of the pressures of the individual gases within that air. When we speak about the different pressures, it's referred to as partial pressure, and this will come up um, a little bit, uh, quite a bit in today's lecture. So we have here the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, partial pressure of nitrogen, just as examples. Dalton's Law states that it is the total pressure that is exerted by a mixture, which is the sum of all the individual pressures within that mixture. Again, Dalton's law states that the total pressure exerted by a mixture of gases is the sum of the individual pressures within a mixture. So we have this gas summed with this, summed with this, written as it is above here, which gives us the total gas mixture, assuming, of course, that temperature and volume in this case are constant amongst the different gases. The term partial pressure means the pressure exerted by any one gas in a mixture of gases or in a liquid. And according to Dalton's law, the partial pressure of gas in a mixture of gases is directly related to the concentration of that gas in the mixture and to the total pressure of the mixture. Here is a breakdown of the levels of different gases that are found within the air. Nitrogen makes up the larger component of air of at least 78%, but it's not of value to us when it comes to cellular respiration, so we won't be discussing much about it. Oxygen makes up 21% of the total air volume, or we could state that the partial pressure is, uh, looking down here, is 159.6 millimeters mercury, or millimeters rather. And you can also see that carbon dioxide makes up about 0.3%. 0.3% and the other gases are less than 1%. The total pressure of the air is the sum of individual gases as already discussed and so all of these added together here. The inspired air which is really the goal of ventilation in the alveoli is what undergoes pulmonary gas exchange and I mentioned in our last class that it's only this air that undergoes pulmonary gas exchange, so the air that reaches the alveoli. Gas diffuses down their pressure gradients, as we already know, and so partial pressure of oxygen will move then from an area of where it's in higher concentration to an area of where it's in lower concentration, and then of course the same is true of carbon dioxide, moving from an area where it's in higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. The table that you can see here shows the relative partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in different places, such as the atmosphere, the alveoli, arteries, veins, different areas in our body, and these numbers are based under usual conditions. There are four main factors that influence the amount of oxygen that can diffuse into the blood. And the same factors apply to carbon dioxide movement in the alveoli as well. The first one here, the oxygen pressure gradient between the alveolar air and the blood impact the amount of oxygen that can actually diffuse in the blood. And we'll talk about this in more detail shortly. Number two is the amount of air that actually makes it to the alveoli or the um, air that actually ventilates the alveoli. Number three, respiratory minute volume. This is a functional measure of the amount of oxygen in a minute that can get into and out of our lungs. The equation is a respiratory rate per minute multiplied by the volume of air inspired per respiration. Number four, an important factor as well is the total functional surface area of the respiratory membrane. We have many individual alveoli and it is the sum total of all the alveoli that makes up the functional surface area of our respiratory membrane. 
On this slide, we're going to first look at this graph right here. And on the x-axis, you can see that we've represented the number, a number of different airway branches. So as a review, we've got the trachea, then we have primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, bronchioles, etc. On the y-axis, axis, this indicates velocity or speed of the movement of air. This line represents velocity here. And the other line here represents cross-sectional area of the airway. Air velocity is going to be high in the upper respiratory tract where the total cross-sectional cross area is low. Airflow is going to slow. It's going to slow down considerably once it reaches the level of the alveoli because the cross-sectional area of all of the alveoli is high. Therefore, ventilation of the alveoli is slow and it's relatively steady, which is opposite to the upper airways, which is characterized by more of a higher velocity or high speed movement. According to Fick's law, the membrane diffusion rate, so the, the rate at which we're going to have the diffusion of carbon dioxide, as shown here, and oxygen, is affected by a few particular factors. One is surface area. Two is solubility of the gas itself. Another is going to be membrane thickness and also the partial pressure gradient. All of these factors impact the rate of diffusion. This figure here is a scanning electron micrograph that's showing the rich blood supply to the alveoli. Uh, the alveoli have been removed from this image so that we can identify I just identify with the vascular supply and there's numerous narrow branches that ensure that each red blood cell within our blood vessels is going to be exposed to the alveolar air and therefore become oxygenated and also able to uh, promptly drop off carbon dioxide. So you can see that dense vasculature surrounding the alveoli which really makes gas exchange as efficient as possible. Let's now look at the individual blood gases at the level of the lung, so at the level of the alveoli. And you can see here oxygen represented on the left, your left as you're looking at the image, and then carbon dioxide on the right. And what I'd like you to make note of is that after, after our tissues have utilized oxygen and given off carbon dioxide into our venous system, this comes back to the heart, and as you know, it's pumped to the lungs. Once it reaches the level of the lungs, in particular the level of the alveoli, you can see this deoxygenated blood coming in. Now within this deoxygenated blood, there is still some oxygen, and there's also carbon dioxide. And so looking here, we have the partial pressure of oxygen is about 40, compared to within the alveoli, the partial pressure of oxygen is 100. Because gas moves from an area of high concentration or high pressure to low pressure, the oxygen is going to leave the alveoli. So this is a well-ventilated alveoli that's received air that we've breathed in. And that oxygen is going to leave the alveoli and enter into the blood vessel. And as you can see, as we move along, showing down here, oxygen is continually being dropped off into or picked up by this vascular network. And then that's going to happen until the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be the same as uh, within the capillary as it is within the alveoli. And then of course this oxygenated blood is going to make its way back to the heart and then be sent out to the rest of the body. Carbon dioxide, similar concept, just a little bit different in that we are bringing this carbon dioxide, this waste product, back to the heart. Uh, back to, sorry, back to the lungs so that we can breathe it off as a gas. And you can see that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide coming to the alveoli is higher within the vessel than it is within the alveoli. And so gas then, this gas as carbon dioxide is going to be moving from an area of higher concentration or higher pressure to lower and make its way into the alveolus where we will breathe it off as a gas. And this will continue to happen as blood moves along the alveoli until the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is the same within the capillary as it is within the alveoli. And then we no longer get the movement of gas in either direction. We, so we know now, based on looking at this slide, how oxygen gets into the blood supply at the level of the alveoli, but now, how is it transported in the blood? We've discussed some of this already before. You can see here hemoglobin, 
which is made up of the four polypeptide chains and at the center you can see a hemoglobin or a heme group I, I mean to say and remember that heme group contains iron and we know that iron binds the oxygen molecule there are four heme groups per hemoglobin each which can bind then four oxygen molecule, molecules. You should recall that the average red blood cell, there are about 250 million hemoglobin, which means that each red blood cell can carry upwards of 1 billion oxygen molecules. Now when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, it is referred to as oxyhemoglobin. On the right, you can see blood vessels or blood cells that are traveling through blood vessels toward the alveoli or toward an alveolus. And at the beginning, the partial pressure of oxygen, as I mentioned on one of our previous slides, is 40 in the blood and 100 in, within the alveolus. Oxygen then gets moved from the alveolus into the blood and it's going to bind to hemoglobin as and become oxyhemoglobin. The vast majority of oxygen is transported this way. In other words, the vast majority of oxygen is transported within whole blood attached to the red blood cells or the hemoglobin. And that equates to about uh, 20 milliliters of oxygen for every 100 milliliters of blood that is transported as oxyhemoglobin. There is a small amount, specifically 0.3 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters, that is not bound directly to hemoglobin as an, and is instead dissolved in the plasma, which you can see here. Let's now look at how carbon dioxide travels or is transported in the blood and this should be somewhat of a review for you. A small amount, so here we have a body cell that's given off carbon dioxide as a waste product and a small amount is going to be transported in the blood just dissolved in the plasma. Okay, so about 10% is transported as carbon dioxide, as uh, carbon dioxide as itself dissolved in the plasma. Some of it is bound to hemoglobin as what's called carb amino hemoglobin and that's about 20%. I had mentioned in the past that carbon dioxide is also carried by hemoglobin, but the difference is that oxygen is carried by the heme group, whereas carbon dioxide is, is carried by the amino group. So we're looking at through this region here, the amino part of the polypeptides. The remaining and the majority, which is 70% of the carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions, which are dissolved within the plasma. And so it has to undergo this chemical reaction, which you can see listed below here. And to summarize, but which should be really a review for you, is that when carbon dioxide is mixed with water within the plasma, it will convert to carbonic acid, provided that carbonic anhydrase is present. Carbonic acid is a fairly weak and relatively unstable acid, so it can quite readily dissociate into bicarbonate ions. And then when, when blood does reach the lungs, the bicarbonate ions are converted back to carbon dioxide to be expelled in our expired air. Of important note is the presence of these hydrogen ions. So when carbon dioxide is broken down in this fashion, hydrogen ions are produced uh, when we have the breakdown of carbonic acid or the dissociation. And what this hydrogen ion will do is make the blood more acidic because it lowers the blood pH. And this, as we know, can impact breathing patterns. We've discussed what happens with gas exchange at the pulmonary level or at the level of the alveoli, but now let's discuss what happens at the systemic level. So now our alveoli have already picked up this oxygen and dropped off carbon dioxide, but this oxygen picked up is going to be brought back to the heart and sent out to our systemic circulation to reach all of our tissues and cells that need oxygen. And this is where cellular respiration occurs. And the same laws apply in terms of pressure gradients and the movement of blood gases. We now have these met uh, metabolically active tissues in our body that require oxygen and also require this immediate need to expel their carbon dioxide. And the same rule applies as we spoke about on the slide with the alveoli and ventilation is that once we reach the level of the tissue, we have oxygenated blood and the partial pressure of oxygen within the blood is higher than within the tissues and so this oxygen, oxygen is going to move from the capillary into the tissues. And then that's going to continue just as we discussed on one of the previous slides, but on the carbon dioxide end of it, carbon dioxide levels are higher in the tissues than they are in the blood, forcing carbon dioxide into the blood, which will then be returned to the heart.
and then uh, and then of course to the lungs. So when the blood leaves our lungs, alveoli have oxygenated the blood, this blood leaves our lungs, it is 97% saturated with oxygen. In other words, most red blood cells are fully saturated by the time they leave our lungs. Now at rest, this is indicating at rest, within our tissues the oxygen level is being depleted as we use it so we utilize oxygen from our red blood cells but we don't use it all in fact less than 25 percent actually moves into the tissues remember though this is at rest so if suddenly this person uh, was performing exercise or you know needed it for fight or, or flight needed to pick up their their level of uh, activity then more oxygen would be utilized within our tissue, so less than 25% is used at rest, but with a, a lot in store, a lot that's been stored for sudden need. Let's now compare rest versus exercise. This image here is exactly what we had on the last slide, and recall that 25% or less than is used our tissues use less than 25% of the oxygen that is saturated our red blood cells at rest. But once we're in a situation where we're exercising, you can see that we're using upwards of 70% of the oxygen that our red blood cells have picked up. You can also see that the partial pressure of oxygen in tissues versus uh, at, during exercise versus at rest and you can see that it goes down so we're utilizing the oxygen within our tissues more frequently more quickly and this graph here summarizes what I just said that at the pulmonary level you can see that hemoglobin is nearly completely saturated with oxygen and then the saturation ends up reducing even at rest because of all of our metabolically active tissues that require oxygen and then it depletes a lot faster when further exercise is implemented. And remember here that we're speaking about oxygen, not carbon dioxide. Lastly, let's look at the interaction between partial pressure of oxygen and partial pressure of carbon dioxide, discussing both the Bohr effect and the Haldane effect. We'll start by looking at the Bohr effect. During exercise, we now are going to have quite an increase in carbon dioxide because we have tissues that are utilizing more oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide. And what you can see here is this right shift of the curve between hemoglobin and oxygen binding, which you can see represented on either side of the graph. The affinity is reduced between hemoglobin and oxygen because of carbon dioxide because of this high carbon dioxide. In other words, hemoglobin will more easily let go of its oxygen when carbon dioxide is present. So if carbon dioxide is detected, increased levels are detected, then hemoglobin is going to more easily let go of its oxygen. And this allows more oxygen to be readily available for the tissues to use it, especially in the case of exercise, which we're speaking of, because oxygen isn't held on as tightly by hemoglobin. And of course exercise isn't the only example, it could be fight, flight, um, exercise, that sort of thing, but the key point to make here is that instead of hemoglobin holding on to its oxygen tightly in the presence of increased amounts of carbon dioxide, the hemoglobin is going to more easily let go of its oxygen. On the right we have the Haldane effect. This refers to the increased total carbon dioxide loading that is caused by a decrease in partial pressure of oxygen. And if we go back to this slide here, during events such as exercise, we have a decreased partial pressure of oxygen. And this is seen, of course, in these metabolic, just going back again, these metabolically active tissues, we have a reduced partial pressure of oxygen. And this reduced partial pressure of oxygen is going to increase the amount of carbon dioxide that is picked up by the blood because it is necessary in circumstances like this. That is the end of today's lecture. Thank you for listening.